You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Dr. David Brady. Uh, he's the author of a book called Fibro Fix. He's an authority on properly diagnosing and treating fibromyalgia. He's been uh, featured in many media about this, um, published in peer-reviewed journals. So, uh, Dr. Brady, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Hey, thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, tell me about uh, fibromyalgia. Um, you know, I know folks may or may not know about it, but what what is the condition like? What do people experience? Oh, well, it's a uh, it's somewhat in, in the medical uh, conventional medical establishment considered a bit of a mysterious. Uh, fuzzy around the edges disorder, if you will, and uh, it's led to a lot of confusion, mistreatment, misdiagnosis, and so forth. But uh, as the years have gone on, uh, things have improved somewhat, but there's still a long way to go. But this is essentially a disorder where the the subject feels profound uh, fatigue most of the time, um, and not really correlated necessarily with, a, with overexertion or anything like that, just a sort of unexplained ongoing fatigue. But Different than chronic fatigue syndrome, it's it's not just the fatigue issue. There's another component to it or a multitude of other components, um, which include this sense of achiness throughout the body. And it's it's a global achiness, meaning it's pervasive. It's all over the body. It's not confined to one one or two regions or areas of the anatomy. It's, uh, it's generally a, a pervasive achiness where the person feels like they're softer or compliant tissues, like the muscles, the, the um, tendons, ligaments, fascia is all very, very achy. Um, and if you squeeze it or touch it or put pressure into the softer tissues, they have a higher perception of pain, or indeed they feel pain to the kind of pressure that would not make them, the average person feel pain. So that's, that's, a, uh, that's something called allodynia, means you feel pain to things you shouldn't feel painful uh, from. And there, there's a bunch of other concomitant things that are usually present as well, which separate it from other disorders, and that is anxiety, some level of depression, sleep disorder is a major component, uh, and then um, a lot of um, gut issues like irritable bowel syndrome type of problems. And we have a bit of an understanding on why these things all coalesce together now, much more so than we used to. And then the final just opening thing I'll say is that this is almost exclusively a woman's uh, disorder. It's very, very rare to have true classic fibromyalgia that really meets the whole um, kind of diagnostic paradigm of fibromyalgia in, in a man. So how did you get involved in this? Oh, probably out of sheer desperation because I had so many patients that I was seeing this with. Uh, and I, I knew from my medical training, I just was not equipped to handle these patients and deal with them. And back, you know, I went to chiropractic school before I ever went to medical school. So I kind of had two different perspectives on it. And you would think between those different levels and types of training, I would have gotten at least some basic information on fibromyalgia that prepared me a little bit for these people when I saw them clinically, but that wasn't the case in either scenario. In fact, you know, back when I trained quite a long time ago now, um, what, what was, what I was, taught about fibromyalgia turned out to be absolutely incorrect um, and uh, full of error, but also it was taught from a perspective of doubt or almost, you know, um, thinking that these patients were really making it up. They were hypochondriacs. It wasn't a real mm -hmm. medical disorder. And we know that that's certainly not the case now, but they're, looking back with hindsight, there's, there's some characteristics about the condition um, that 
led to that kind of bias in in the medical um, establishment of that day, at least. Yeah, the medical establishment loves to tell people for all kinds of problems that they're just crazy. They, you know, low thyroid, fibromyalgia, you know, everything's well, in their mind. But they, they love to tell people. Well, particularly if they don't have good answers for it. If it's a disorder that's almost exclusively women, and particularly at the time, doctors were predominantly male. There was disconnect there. And, you know, things things that were mostly women's problems in the past have often been dismissed as hysteria, right? You even see terminology like you need a hysterectomy, right? You need your female parts taken out because you're crazy and making this all up and being hysterical. So even the procedure is named after the gender bias in it, so which is pretty ironic. But uh, I think the same thing kind of was going on with fibromyalgia for many, many years. Now, we things have changed a lot, right? I mean, a lot of the physicians now are, are, are female, and, and there's a much better understanding of the disorder, but it's still nebulous. It's still something that uh, suffers from some of the same kind of uh, – misinformation. And that's one of the reasons that over the years when I, you know, concentrated on this disorder as one of the focuses of my practice and career, both academically, clinically, and then in research and in my writing, um, for many, many years, I spent uh, a lot of time writing with some partners at different academic institutions trying to kind of educate my peers uh, on this, you know, that it, it isn't just this thing people are making it up. They really have significant issues. They're often misdiagnosed. And you need to learn about this because what you learn in medical school is not right. Yeah. So what, what have you learned? Is there, a, have you figured out a physiological basis for this or is it more just in the treatment side? Like what have, what have you figured out? Well, we figured out a couple of things that dispel myths that doctors still cling on to. Like the fact that even though it's a pain disorder, it's not an inherently infl inflammatory disorder. Most doctors associate pain with inflammation and inflammation with pain. And while that's true in many cases, there are types of pain we know now that are not based on the typical pain type of phenomena involving tissue trauma, tissue um, damage, and inflammation. And therefore, anti-inflammatories don't work, steroids don't work, none of the normal things we do for inflammatory-based pain works, but yet doctors still in their mind think it's inflammatory because there's pain involved. Um, number two, yeah. a lot of them think it's autoimmune. You'll often see fibromyalgia listed in lists of autoimmune disorders. And from at least what we know today, it not, does not have the characteristics of autoimmune diseases. And a lot of doctors, the third thing they'll often say that's incorrect is that it's a muscle problem uh, because the patient perceives this pain and achiness in the muscles and the softer tissues versus in the joints or in the hard tissues like the bones. So it's very different clinically from arthritis, let's say. If your problem is joint pain all over, you don't have fibromyalgia, right? That the pain is perceived in the soft tissues. So being that most of those are muscle, doctors think it's a muscle problem. So they've given them muscle relaxers and they prescribe all kinds of physical medicine things that are, are directed at the muscle. And you have, you know, chiropractors, massage therapists, physiotherapists, body workers, acupuncturists, and all, you know, all the different kind of physical medicine uh, practitioners doing physical things to the muscle. And in true, and they, they help a lot of people because a lot have muscular based problems like myofascial pain that are misdiagnosed as having fibromyalgia. But the true fibromyalgia patient, the problem is not in the muscle. The problem isn't where they perceive the pain. The problem is actually in the central nervous system. So it's in the brain and it's in the spinal cord and it's in the nervous system deep in the way the body is processing information uh, in an incorrect way. It's almost like, you know, people who have a limb cut off, have an amputation. Years later, they can still feel pain in that limb that's no longer there. They perceive it. It's phantom limb pain. And the problem isn't in the limb because the limb is long gone. But in their brain, the perception is that there's pain in this limb that's no longer there. So treatment directed at those areas of the body don't get anybody anywhere. They don't result in any positive change. So, so I mean, we I don't know where it comes from or you do, or I mean, how would you, well, you it, characterize your knowledge of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's no universally accepted fundamental etiology or cause of fibromyalgia, but we there are many hypotheses uh, based on a lot of really good information. And some things that we do know, that it is a deep-seated central nervous system brain type of problem, and it involves a phenomena known as hypervigilance, which means the nervous system 
is kind of thrown into this feedback locked loop of being in a hypervigilant state or a sympathetic dominant, almost a fight or flight state. So it's almost like the nervous system is always on guard and waiting for the next catastrophe or the next shoe to drop, right? The next thing to happen. So the body at the level deep in the nervous system is always on guard. So when you stay in a persistent state like that, there's inherent price to pay uh, physiologically. And you see that with, you know, the propensity of anxiety, panic attack, insomnia. These patients can't sleep. They have racing mind. They can't get to sleep. But when they do get to sleep, they can sleep for 12, 14 hours and they wake up feeling like they never slept. They have a they have a type of sleep dysfunction, which is known as unrefreshed sleep, right? They, they, they can't sleep their way out of it, even though they're tired, because they're, we find out when we put them in a sleep lab, and this was actually originally found quite a long time ago, going back to the late 70s, early 80s, uh, one of the world sleep experts at the University of Toronto, Harvey Moldovsky, found um, when he was putting these people in sleep labs that they had a very, very specific type of sleep dysfunction called alpha wave intrusion. So alpha waves are these waves our brains are full of when we're first trying to get to sleep and we're kind of in that state of kind of not quite asleep or kind of not quite fully awake, but it's a very superficial type of rest or sleep where we need to progress through the stages of sleep as we go through the night. And it's really when we get into the stage three and four, what's often called deep sleep or delta wave sleep, that we get tremendous amounts of restoration in the body. The brain gets the rest. The nervous system gets the rest. We have different hormonal changes that cause regeneration of tissues and helping the muscles recover from the day before. These patients, even though they sleep a long time on the clock, they don't progress through the full stages of sleep as they should. And even when they do get into stage three or four sleep, or that supposedly restorative sleep, they have alpha waves running through their delta waves. That's why they call it alpha wave intrusion. The alpha waves are intruding on their delta waves, and therefore they never get that restorative, regenerative sleep. The delta waves occur during deep sleep, right? But the alpha waves occur during what, REM or what part of sleep? Alpha waves basically occur during um, stage one sleep, which is kind of, some people call mm. it mindful rest, right? It's the very beginning of sleep where... When you're in stage three and four sleep, you should have delta waves, very, very different, much larger waves. So, um, and this is a type of sleep dysfunction that is normally not diagnosed when you send someone to a sleep lab because sleep studies and sleep labs, conventional ones that a lot of people get, they're looking for one thing. They're looking for sleep apnea, right? <laughs> and this is not the same pattern as classic sleep apnea. So you have to have someone who really knows what they're doing and is looking for this specific pattern um, to be able to have it diagnosed properly. But it still remains today one of the only true objective measurements that we can do um, in fibromyalgia patients to help diagnose them. Because there's no fibromyalgia factor laboratory test. There's no blood test. There's, there's some imaging stuff that has been emerging in functional MRIs and PET scans and things like that. And they are working on new sort of laboratory molecular signatures, if you will, of fibromyalgia, but they're still very far off from being accepted as, as an actual diagnosis. So one of the things we can turn to is the hallmark sleep dysfunction of fibromyalgia. And in turn, one of the most therapeutic things we can do to help people on their journey to recovery from classic fibromyalgia is to improve their sleep quality, their sleep hygiene, uh, their, their, their predictability of sleep. So we work a lot with people on their sleep and on their brainwaves, on you know, using cognitive behavioral therapies and real-time EEG and brainwave retraining and heart rate variability and biofeedback and you know, from those kind of higher tech things to even more simplistic things such as meditation and, and guided imagery and deep breathing and mindfulness and things like that. They're very, very um, actually beneficial in ways that drugs are not in this type of disorder. Okay. So can you go through your process? You, know, you mentioned a lot of different types of therapies. Um, what's an example of a person you saw? What did they have going on? What therapies did you apply? You know, what did the therapies look like? And then what happened to the person? Okay, well, I mean, classic scenario is, you know, uh, it's usually a middle-aged or so female comes in, 
uh, and they've been through the ringer, been through a million specialists, went through many years before they got you know, a, a diagnosis, often a fibromyalgia. And uh, when they come in, you know, they, they're in because they, they think they have fibromyalgia. We might have some way to help them because they're usually on one or two of the drugs that are approved for fibromyalgia and they're not getting better. Uh, so, you know, we, we really sit down and talk to them and try to figure out, do they have all of the things that really align with them truly having fibromyalgia? And some of those I mentioned, you know, the achiness in the, or perceived achiness throughout the entire body in the softer tissues. They have anxiety, they have depression, they have sleep disturbance, they have um, bowel issues, right? Um, and if that's the case, then, uh, you know, we proceed on through the workup and we do, you know, pretty um, detailed physical examinations to make sure that where they're perceiving their pain is indeed in these soft tissues, not in the joints, that it is perceived all over the body. So we're basically trying to rule out that they don't have something else. We'll do different laboratory work to make sure they don't have an inflammatory autoimmune disorder, right? That they don't have a, yes. a connective tissue autoimmunity or they don't have lupus or, arth or rheumatoid arthritis or MS or all these types of things. These things need to be ruled out. What, what about jumping to a sleep study to see if there's alpha wave intrusion? Would that uh, shortcut the process or is that a mistake? Well, the problem is in finding sleep studies uh, or finding sleep centers that are capable of actually doing a sleep study that will find that type of sleep disruption and is and are aware of it. Uh, secondly, they're 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 not cheap studies and they're not easy to do, right? You got to go to a sleep center and sleep overnight and things like that. And in many cases, we don't need that to make the clinical diagnosis. Uh, you know, we can use all these other things, and it's pretty pretty clear when you're ruling out the other things that it that it might be. But I have to tell you. The majority of people who come in claiming they have fibromyalgia, either they were told by a neighbor, they were told by a friend, they were diagnosed by their family doctor, even all the way up to, you know, diagnosed by a rheumatologist at a center of excellence. The majority of them that come in, we find out, have other stuff. They don't have fibromyalgia. They don't really meet that criteria. And then when we find mm -hmm. out what it really is, it could be poor thyroid function that's not screaming classic primary hypothyroidism so their doctor didn't pick it up because they didn't have a TSH that was through the roof but they still had far from optimal thyroid function for them or they had problems making ATP or energy in the cells so they had what we call a mitochondrial uncoupling which is pervasive these days with our level of toxins and plasticides and so forth in the environment or they had a musculoskeletal issue they had myofascial pain syndrome so those things are way more common and unfortunately, though, when doctors get a middle-aged female in and she says, oh, I hurt all over, I'm tired, um, I, I have some bowel issues, they jump to the conclusion they have fibromyalgia and they put them on Lyrica or one of the other drugs yeah. for it, and they don't get better. Some of them do because sometimes they get lucky and they get it right. But So our first job is to differentially diagnose them correctly. But back to your question, if they do seem to have classic fibromyalgia, then we work with them on a multitude of planes. So one would be trying to calm down that hypervigilance, that, that sort of sympathetic driven nervous system. So some of the best stuff in the medical literature as far as treatment outcome in fibromyalgia is various forms of cognitive behavioral therapy. So we work with them first in office with EEG studies, training them how to kind of calm themselves and retrain their brain a bit. And then we move them off pretty rapidly to home-based therapy, sometimes on their iPad or iPhone, like heart rate variability exercises, uh, and we get them trying to meditate, more like uh, relaxing, stretching, kind of range of motion, yoga stuff, deep breathing, guided imagery, all those types of things. Parallel to that, we're paying a lot of attention to their sleep hygiene. We're trying to get reestablish a good circadian rhythm in bed by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock latest, up by, you know, 7 in the morning, um, making sure they're consistent with that, making sure they have a quiet, dark, comfortable place to sleep, no pets in the bed, no TV, you know, playing in the bedroom, no electronics at night. We use things to uh, blue blocking kind of goggles. Uh, uh, we'll use amber goggles at night for them, or we'll get their light fixtures changed in the, in the areas of the house that they're in at night. And we put apps on their devices if they insist on using them to pull the blue spectrum out of the light because that's telling their brain it's noon and they're not making melatonin. So they can't go to sleep. And then, then we'll hit the biochemical side. So 
you know, we, we don't tend to jump to the drugs for fibromyalgia because they just, the studies are clear. They don't work very well and they have a lot of side effects. Um, and there's never been a drug developed for fibromyalgia. They're, they're repurposed old drugs with new names for fibromyalgia. And they include one, on one side antidepressants um, and on the other side anti-epileptic drugs. Um, so we tend to favor doing other things, using things to help them sleep if necessary. Things like uh, the, the neurotransmitter GABA, uh, things like melatonin if they need it calming botanicals at night. So we use herbal medicine a lot, valerian, valerian root, passion flower, um, ashwagandha. These are all things that are calming to the central nervous system. And then we know in these patients, they generally have a very low state of serotonin in the central nervous system and in the enteric nervous system in the gut. It's one of the reasons they have motility problems and they suffer from constipation and irritable bowel syndrome problems. So we give them a nutraceutical that helps them themselves make more serotonin. It's something called 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. It can be very helpful. And then we're often using things to try to change their pain perception by manip manipulating the cannabinoid system. So we do use quite a bit of um, uh, CBD. Uh, usually it's uh, CBD standardized, you know, really high quality nutraceutical grade CBD from hemp. So it's not necessarily medical marijuana, although that can be useful. Um, that has the THC and the, you know, the brain altering effects where if most people don't want that and we use CBD quite effectively in these patients. So it's really a combination of using central nervous system, calming botanicals and herbals and nutraceuticals, helping people sleep better, calming them down. But we do have to, depending on what their past is, you know, look at getting them into some sort of counseling and working with uh, someone who can deal with some of the, a lot of them have past trauma. They have a remarkably high incidence of very tumultuous childhood experiences, uh, feeling unsafe, trauma, abuse, um, not always, you know, overt abuse, but certainly if they have sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, uh, is very damaging to the early developing nervous system, particularly in, in, in girls. Uh, boys in that situation go on to develop dysfunction later on in life, but different types of dysfunction. They tend to be easy to anger, easy to you know get very frustrated, act out in violence physically. Uh, they tend to be repeat abusers in the way they were abused. Females don't do that. Females develop anxiety, panic attack, IBS, and fibromyalgia. So the female and male brain kind of deals and copes with these types of difficult, adverse childhood events and or past trauma uh, in different ways. So how do you, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different therapies and interventions here. How do you have a Pareto? What do you tackle first? And you know, what's your decision tree look like? And how many of these therapies do you apply to somebody? Uh, in classic fibromyalgia, if you really want to pull someone out, you have to hit it on a multitude of planes. It's not one therapy at a time. You have to hit it on the sort of psychological side. You have to hit it on the, you know, the nervous system uh, side with, with the kind of cognitive behavioral therapies we were talking about. You have to hit it on the biochemical side as well. So we're doing many of these things concomitantly together. And what's nice about them, though, is the therapies I've talked about really have no downside other than it takes time to do some of them. There's some, some, some expense into them, but there's really no downside from a side effect profile other than there's a potential in some people that it doesn't work. But in many cases, it does work and it works to varying degrees in different people. And it works uh, at varying levels of you know, rapidity uh, in different people as well. And in some of those patients who we very carefully select, we use pharmacotherapy as well, uh, but we really try to avoid it because just quite frankly, the drugs that we have available today for fibromyalgia, just they don't work very well. Hmm. When patients come in and you figure out they do have fibromyalgia, again, what's the conversation like? You know, we're going to do this and that and this and that. And this. You know, I mean, well, does the patient react well to this, that you have all these different things that, that, that could help them or do they, you know, do they tend to pick and choose? Well, you know, I'll do this, but I don't want to do that type thing. I mean, what, what do you experience? Not, not, not very much, but, you know, there's individual variability. And I, I would have to say that probably my 
my patient population is, is a bit uh, self-selected in that if they're coming to see me, they've probably read my book already. They've probably seen interviews with me already. They may have even read some of my medical papers or textbooks or what have you. So they kind of know what they're getting into, and they're trying to seek solutions that are not the exact, you know, uh, standard orthodox go to their family physician or the rheumatologist because usually they've done that already and they're not getting good results. Um, so they're looking for something more, you know, uh, comprehensive, if you will, and a different type of approach. And that can be um, in addition to in a complementary type of way, or it could be instead of because they just weren't getting good results that way. So, you know, most of them will come to me, they're ready to listen to, you know, what I'm, what I'm telling them and they're ready to, uh, be educated a little bit on what fibromyalgia is and what it's not, because many of them don't understand it, or they've been misled, or they've been treated by providers who just don't fully understand it. Um, so it, it really is a mixed bag. But uh, you know, ultimately the patient is uh, is the boss, right? They decide. They're they're their own most important self uh, advocate. Uh, that's why I really. Um, um, really want them to read my book and learn more about the approach before they even come in because they need to decide that this is what they want to do. But, you know, if if they come in and I give them sort of a plan uh, based on many years of experience in treating thousands of patients with this, um, you know, they're going to have to decide do they want to do it or not. I mean, if I, if I have a, a protocol for them, I, I'm not going to basically engage with a patient uh, in, in the patient doctor relationship on the basis of them looking at every single thing I'm suggesting and saying, I'll do this. I won't do this. I'll do this. I won't do that because it's going to be a setup for failure. So if that's the case, then I, my preference is they find another provider who has an approach that they are entirely comfortable with at least giving it a, a try, right? And with, for long enough, fully engaged enough, to determine if it's going to work or not for them. Hmm. Okay. Is there anyone studying to try to figure out the root cause of fibro fibromyalgia, or has it been ignored lar largely by uh, doctors? No, there's tons of researchers all over the world that have been working on this for decades, but it's an elusive thing. Um, there are various, you know, hypotheses. There are various things that have been found, but as of yet, we just like many diseases, we don't understand the fundament fundamental underlying initial cause or etiology, not only of fibromyalgia, but of most diseases, quite frankly. So, I mean, that's, that's just reality. Um, so fibromyalgia has particularly been challenging because, you know, here you have this sort of significant pain disorder that you can give all the things you normally give for pain up into and including opioid medications, and they don't work, right? So this is an entirely different type of pain. And in fact, the pain researchers are even talking about this type of pain now as third pain because it's a third type, a new type that we didn't understand before, but it's really a deep-seated pain that is associated a lot with past experience, past trauma, um, and past life events that seems to uh, emanate from sort of compensatory mechanisms that occur in the brain over time, um, where you're in this constant state of hypervigilance, and you perceive everything as painful, um, which is interesting, even as a metaphor goes. If these people were traumatized or had some sort of past events, uh, you know, they're perceiving things that even shouldn't be painful as painful. But the normal things that treat pain don't work with these patients. So it's sort of a steep learning curve throughout all of the different uh, types of professionals in the medical system, because it's, it's really an oddball. It's not behaving like other things, although there's a strong correlation and latching uh, to things like irritable bowel syndrome, panic attack, uh, anxiety disorders, uh, which we see becoming more and more prevalent, unfortunately. Well, uh, by seeing so many people clinically, you must have a very different perception. So where do you think the, uh, the real heart of the matter is going to be? I mean, you again, you have all these therapies you can apply, but I would think in order to figure it out, you might have to apply them one, then the next, then the next. I guess you, you're you walking an ethical tightrope. You know, you want the best result for the client, but you also want to figure out the underlying cause and the science behind it. You're, you're describing research when applying it to clinical care, and those are two very different things. I mean, if you're running a research trial 
trying to find viable treatments or get to uh, etiologies, then you're right. You may need to apply monotherapies to uh, uh, to ascertain what's going on. But in a clinical treatment scenario, we often apply multiple therapies simultaneously because we know they're attacking a problem on different planes or through different mechanisms of action. So, you know, how we would treat someone in a research trial versus how we would treat them in a, in a, in a clinical practice are, are often two very different things. And no matter what disorder you're talking about. So, you know, that stuff is certainly going on and I've participated in those, but from a clinical treatment standpoint right now, we're trying to do everything we can for these people to get them better. How long does it take to see uh, positive results? You know, do you, do you hit them with five treatments in one day? Is it over the course of two weeks? You know, uh, maybe there is a way without, you know, harming the person to order the treatments that you give them, even if it's only days apart, to see if there's a difference in the effects. Well, this isn't the kind of thing where it's an intensive in-office scenario where they're getting five treatments in a day. I mean, we're giving them, uh, just like you would give a prescription, we're giving them various things to take. Uh, every day orally, right? Generally, it doesn't really involve IV therapies or injectable therapies. So it's it's oral things that they take by mouth. Uh, the cognitive behavioral therapies are things that, you know, they may come in for a series of treatments to learn these practices more intensive in the beginning. Um, and then they, we're, we're trying to transition them away from provider-dependent therapy. So we're trying to learn, teach them how to do things on their own and work it into their daily life as a as a lifestyle practice, uh, whether it's specific types of you know uh, range of motion, moving, stretching, to things like meditation and and things like cognitive behavioral therapies. If we have them working with a counselor or a therapist or a psychi- psychologist or a psychiatrist, then they're sort of doing that in parallel to uh, to what we're doing. But usually, if someone has Classic fibromyalgia, the real, the real deal, this central mediated, you know, pain perception issue. Um, usually, we can tell if we're moving them on a positive trajectory, you know, within four to six weeks. Um, but uh, a lot of times, it takes a lot longer than that to get them, you know, uh, as as well as they can be. Uh, this is a difficult multifactorial condition that develops over a very long period of time. And it's not amenable to take one pill and it all goes away in a day. It just doesn't work like that. We wish it did. Maybe someday we'll have a therapy that can, uh, that can act like that, but that's certainly not the state of, uh, state of things right now. Uh, but there is different uh, variability in how people respond because they have different levels of the disorder and different types of uh, things that are attached to it from their past in many cases. Uh, On the other side, many patients who come in, I said even the majority of them that think they have fibromyalgia for various reasons, turn out to have other medical disorders. And, you know, if it's a case of a a not properly diagnosed or an underappreciated thyroid issue, we can we can fix that really quick. And that's that's way easier. Right. We get their thyroid running right and their metabolism running right. And they turn around very quickly in a matter of weeks. Uh, same thing with energy deficiency disorders, mitochondrial dysfunction. We can often uh, deal with that with very strategic clinical nutrition and different things to push mitochondrial function. Um, and if it's myofascial pain syndrome, it's really sending them off to really good quality physical you know, medicine practitioners that can really work hands-on uh, with their musculoskeletal system. Would you be able to pseudonymize or and make anonymous your clinical data and then pass it off to a number of researchers where it would inform what kind of studies they would want to do. Because I would think there's a lot of, you know, maybe patterns in uh, the clinical data. Let's say you've seen a thousand patients, you know, that uh, would be great to inform researchers. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm an academic and a clinician, so I'm playing in both uh, sides of the pool all the time and, you know, discussing our approaches and findings with various uh, clinical researchers. Uh, it's mostly clinical outcome researchers versus mechanistic uh, researchers. There's, you know, various types all working in this field. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I share my clinical experience uh, quite frequently with uh, with researchers and conduct research myself. So uh, that's kind of ongoing and happens, um, you know, all the time. But yeah, I'm always willing to to do that with, within the ability to do it. I mean, 
the way you, uh, you know, the way you collect data in a clinical practice is not always exactly the same as you would do in a structured uh, research, you know, protocol. So uh, oftentimes they're not exactly analogous to one another, and it's it's not as easy as transferring data, if you will. But yeah, I mean, the clinicians uh, and the researchers in in this field have been attempting to work together, I think, fairly well. Uh, most of the researchers in the field that are researching fibromyalgia are indeed clinicians themselves. So it's not like there's just a bunch of PhDs, you know, and scientists working on it in research and a bunch of doctors, you know, clinical people seeing patients. Most of the world's experts in fibromyalgia research are, in fact, clinicians. Most of them are rheumatologists, in fact, with, you know, specialty training in, in fibromyalgia. So that that's not the case in all disorders. So that, that's a good thing. Okay. Well, very good. So what's the best way for uh, people that are interested, you know, or have a problem or want to find out more? How do they get in touch? Uh, well, probably the, the best place for them to go if they're really particularly interested in fibromyalgia and, you know, global pain and fatigue syndromes is my website, fibrofix.com. So F-I-B-R-O-F-I-X.com. That has the most specific information on fibromyalgia and related disorders. And there's all kinds of content on that site, uh, uh, published articles of mine, interviews, uh, but there's information on the book as well if they're interested in the book and different types of approaches. And in the book, I really try to bring people through um, a lot of different scenarios, questionnaires, uh, have them really look at their own journey and their own past and everything and try to figure out, you know, do I really likely have this classic fibromyalgia or may have may I have one of these other things that are often misdiagnosed and that are masquerading as fibromyalgia? Because that's very important because the big key is to, you know, as they say, proper diagnosis is half the cure. You have to have the right diagnosis in order to try to arrive at a meaningful treatment. But uh, for other information, they can also turn to my main professional uh, website, which is just drdavidbrady.com. So Dr. David Brady. DrDavidBrady.com, and both of them have information on my private practice uh, and lots of other resources. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, Dr. Brady, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Great. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.